of the S matrix. One of them is unitarity. The other is crossing symmetry, which tells you that there are relativistic processes in which the amplitudes are related to each other. Now, how do you connect the amplitudes in one f in region to amplitudes in another region? And that's supplied by the property of analyticity. And that's the property we're going to do now. Hopefully, we will have so enough time to do that. Now, I wanted to make uh, a connection to uh, Antimo Polano's uh, talk yesterday. Um, as I like, you, you, you probably recognize, I like drawing these Mandelstam planes because this shows you where the action is. So what I've drawn here, look at only the one on the left. This is the amplitude in this channel for pi k goes to pi k. And this will also be pi k goes to pi k. And this will be the channel pi pi goes to kk bar. Now, each of these channels, there are resonances. So in the pi k channel, there is the k star. So this is the s channel, this region. This is the u channel, and this is the t channel. And the boundaries are these hyperbole that I've just drawn here. Now, in the k, pi k to pi k, there are these resonances, the k stars, that sit in this channel, and similarly in this channel. And in the pi pi to kk bar, there are resonances like the rho and the f0, but they sit below kk bar threshold, because kk bar threshold is at 1 GeV, essentially. So these are actually below the threshold, and then there are other resonances that appear up here. Now what you notice is that the resonances, the only place where the, the resonances in one channel intersect a resonance happening in another channel is in regions that are unphysical. You can't have a resonance in the S channel and have a resonance in the T channel at the same time. But if instead of doing pi pi to k, uh, k pi k to pi k, you do D, where D is a charm state, DK to pi K. So now the process is DK to pi K. Because the D is heavy, the thresholds for the S channel and U channel and T channel move further away. But because the sum of the masses are bigger, what is called the Mandelstam triangle in the middle becomes much bigger because it's now got the D mass squared in a, in, instead of a pion mass squared. And as we discussed the other day, there is now a new channel that appears, namely the channel in which D can go to kk bar pi. And that physical region is in here. This is the region which is called the equivalent of the Dalitz plot. And what you notice is that the different resonances in the different channels can happen simultaneously in this. So in the analyses that Antimo Polano was talking about, in, in which heavy particles decay, you can have particles in the pi k channel and in the kk bar channel happening at the same time. And you can study the interference between them. So that's what he was doing, looking at the various bands in different directions. It's just a redrawing of that decay region. So one of the beauties of heavy flavor decays is it allows you to study the interferences between them. And the interferences contain information which you don't have in any one of the channels. Now. The property that connects the amplitude from the S channel to the T channel to the U channel, or even in the middle here, is the property of analyticity. Namely, that amplitudes are analytic functions of the Mandelstam variables S, T, and U. And they are analytic in that they're complex functions of complex variables. And these complex functions have 
cuts in them. They have discontinuities. And the discontinuities are those generated, required by unitarity. So unitarity, we saw yesterday, required that imaginary parts suddenly appeared and they appear not only just in the S channel, but in the T channel and the U channel. And this means this function has a set of discontinuities. So the amplitude for one value of S plus I epsilon and S minus I epsilon will be different. So analyticity, which is a, a consequence of causality, why it is, I, I don't have time to tell you, but consequence of causality. It tells you that the amplitude, which I'm actually going to call F, sometimes I call it T, is a complex function of ST and U, complex function of ST and U, with singularities with only singularities required by unitarity. So let's um, draw a, a different process just because it'll be easier. Um, this is just for me. Uh, I'll tell you what it is in a second. Sorry, I haven't done that very well. Okay, we'll see why you, why I've done that. That that comes in. Okay. So let me let's remember something or recall um, something about uh, recall Cauchy's theorem. So here is some complex plane, which we'll call the S plane. So it's the real and imaginary parts. And then Cauchy's theorem says that the value of a function at that point can be found by integrating round a contour. So Cauchy's theorem says that if you have a function of S, it's equal to 1 over 2 pi i times the integral round a contour of the s primed f of s primed over s primed minus s. Now, if you don't remember that, you probably do remember that Cauchy's theorem says that the integral round a contour is equal to 2 pi i times the residue of the function. So here is, the, consider this function. It has a pole at s primed equals s, and its residue at s primed equals s is f of s. So that's what that states. Okay. Now we learned that all our partial wave amplitudes have cuts in them. And these cuts start at some threshold. Let's just assume that they only have a cut on this side. So the value there and the value there is not the same. And again, let me call that value ST. Now Cauchy's theorem says that you can choose any contour. So let's take this contour here and pull it out. But because there's a cut where the amplitude has a discontinuity, we can't pull it right out to be a big circle. We have to pull it out in a rather complicated way. So we pull it out so it's here, 
that's no problem. Here's a big circle. It's supposed to be a circle. But here, we have to go along here and go round like that. And the clock, if you remember, always goes anti-clockwise. So let us imagine that this big circle is where the modulus of S is equal to some capital S, some big value. So the circle's not at infinity, it's at some big value. So what does this tell us? It says the integral is equal to 1 over 2 pi i times something which probably mathematicians wouldn't recognize, namely a contour which is not closed, which is this contour round here, from there to there. So that bit we'll just leave. And then we have the contour, it goes this way. We've got the integral from this big value of s to st on the lower side of the cut and then along the top side of the cut. So we can write this as 1 over 2 pi i times the integral from st to capital S, ds primed over s prime minus s. We've got the integral from here to here on the top side, so that's f of s plus s primed plus i epsilon. And then we've got the integral going the other way round, along the bottom, but the wrong way, so that's minus the integral this way, f of s primed minus i epsilon. But because the function is a real analytic function, this is just the complex conjugate of this function. So the difference between those two, as we learned yesterday, is 2i times the imaginary part of the function. So this bit is 2i times the imaginary part of the function. Now, if this function converges, so let's assume that if we make the contour bigger and bigger, the function dies away, then we can take capital S to infinity. This integral won't matter anymore, and we'll just have an integral that runs along the cut like this which will go from threshold to infinity over the imaginary part of the amplitude. Now, that's a very useful thing to have because it says, if you know the imaginary part of the amplitude along here, where you do your experiments, you actually then know the function everywhere in the complex plane. Now we can make use, in particular cases, of the optical theorem, because the optical theorem says that the total cross-section which you measure is related to the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. So by measuring the total cross-section, you know the imaginary part of elastic amplitudes. And so you know the imaginary part from threshold to wherever you measure it, and if it goes, assume that it dies at infinity, then you know the function everywhere. Now, if the function doesn't die at infinity, then uh, you have to do something else. So we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. So if f of s goes to 0, as the modulus of s goes to infinity, seem to have lost contact here, right? Then we have f of s is equal to 1 over pi, the integral from st to infinity, ds primed over s prime minus s, times the imaginary part of the amplitude. So we just have the integral along the cut, 
And we can replace that if we take the forward, take, treat little f as the forward scattering amplitude, would tell us what it is everywhere. Okay. Now we're going to apply this to the particular example that I've drawn here, which is the process that in the S channel, or in the T channel, is pi minus pi plus goes to pi zero pi zero. The reason for choosing that process is that the amplitude here and in these two channels is the same. And in fact, the scattering amplitude, now not the partial waves, but the whole scattering amplitude, has not only a right-hand cut, but it also has a left-hand cut. So you can imagine if there was another cut along here, you do the same integral. But because it's the same process, the integral is going to be, they're going to be related to each other. So we're going to apply this assuming so apply to the pi minus pi zero goes to pi minus pi zero amplitude so f of s is equal to f of s and t so that's the scattering amplitude for this with t fixed and we're going to choose t in a very particular region between naught and 4m pi squared so t is just a fixed variable and we're going to choose t to be some value here so this is the line t equals zero, and we're going to choose this along that line. And we'll assume that f of s and t in this region goes to zero as s goes to infinity. Now, f of s and t has a right-hand cut and a left-hand cut. So we have to slightly modify what we just had. But it just means there's another contribution which comes from taking the integral contour around there. So we'll do that. And provided the contour at infinity vanishes, we prove that this scattering amplitude, and why it's this one, we'll, we'll see in a minute. So it goes from 4m pi squared to infinity. And this is the piece that we already had. And now, because of the left-hand cut, there is also another piece. So t is just a fixed variable, so it's not doing anything. It's just like that. So that's the generalization of what we just had. Now, as an example of a value of t, let's put t equal to zero. If t is equal to zero, then this is the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. And that's related to a total cross-section. 
and total cross-sections are positive. So if we choose S and T, or equally S and U, to be less than 4M squared, then this factor, since S primed is bigger than 4M squared, and S primed is bigger than 4M squared, so if we choose S, T and U to be less than 4M squared, this factor is positive, this factor is positive, this is a total cross-section, so the answer has to be positive. So the amplitude anywhere inside for this process inside that triangle which is below the threshold for all the processes has to be positive there. Now, what's that got to do with anything? So for S T and U in the interval 0 to 4m squared. Oh, uh, yes, I have to explain something in a second. One other thing. It's certainly true when t equals 0. Um, then f of s and t is positive. OK. So let me, let me back up a second. If t is equal to 0, which is along this line, then because it's the total cross-section that appears here, the forward scattering amplitude, that's obviously positive. But what if I choose t not equal to zero, but a bit bigger? Then you're in an unphysical region. The physical region is here. So cos theta, the scattering angle in the S-channel, is plus one there and minus one there. And when you go outside beyond the forward direction, cos theta gets bigger than 1. So first of all, the imaginary part of f and s and t equals naught is related to the total cross-section with some positive quantities, which is positive. But we can write m of s and t equal to a sum of partial wave amplitudes. If you go to a region where cos theta is a bit bigger than 1, when cos theta equals 1, the Legendre polynomials are all equal to 1. If you make cos theta a little bit bigger than 1, they're still bigger. They get bigger. If I plot uh, one of the Legendre polynomials or whatever, they, they have, or, or the square of them, here, here is P, the square of P2. It does that. So at this point, at cos theta equals 1, it's 1. And if you make cos theta bigger than 1, it gets still bigger. So PL of z greater than 1 is greater than 1 for all of them. You have to worry whether this still converges. Well, it does up to 4m squared. So what you can prove, because of that, is that the amplitude has to be positive inside that region. Now, what's that got to do with anything? Okay. So obviously this is positive. Okay. Now, pions are rather special. They're called and we don't have time to discuss this if you don't know what they are. They're the Goldstone bosons of chiral symmetry breaking. They have the property that if all the quark masses were equal to zero, then QCD has a property in which you can turn left-handed fields into right-handed fields 
and the world is unchanged. And as a consequence of that, or the fact that that chiral symmetry is broken, is that pions, in a world in which the quark masses are zero, are massless. All the other particles, made out of a quark and an antiquark, have masses. Even if the quark mass, the current quark mass, is equal to zero, whereas pions are massless. So in the limit, so I've got to do this rather quickly because we don't have much time, that the quark masses go to zero, the mass of the pion goes to zero. And it turns out that the pion mass divided by a typical hadronic scale is indeed a very small number. The mass of the pion is 140 MeV. What is relevant is the square of the mass. So if you compare it to some typical mass like the mass of the proton, it's a very small number. So pions are very close to being massless. So this is uh, in the real world. Now a pion decays, made up of an up and an anti-down quark, by then producing a W, and then turning into a mu plus and a neutrino. That's the main decay of a charged pion. Now long before it was realized that the weak interaction was mediated by the W boson, it was nevertheless known that the current, or essentially the field that connected the pion to the vacuum, namely made it decay. So between zero and the pion. This is a field which is equal to the pion decay constant. It decayed through something called an axial vector. An axial vector you can think of now as the W the W boson. It's proportional to a number which is called the pion decay constant. And because this is a vector, there's got to be something on this side of the equation that also carries that Lorentz index. And the only thing that it can be is the pion's momentum. Clearly doesn't depend on the speed of the moon. So it only can depend on the pion's momentum because the pion is spinless. In fact, at first, this is a little bit surprising in terms of W's because a pion is a pseudoscalar particle and a W is a vector boson. But the W is a vector boson when its mass is 80 GeV. When its mass is 140 MeV, so this propagator is way away from its mass shell, it has a component which indeed is a, a pseudoscalar particle and couples to a pseudoscale. Now, if you take the divergence of this, the divergence means the wave function of the pion is e to the i p dot x. So you take the derivative with respect to x, the space co coordinate, and it brings down another factor of momentum. And we won't worry about i's too much. And that's going to be equal to the mass of the pion squared. So the matrix element connected with the pion decay is proportional to its momentum. And the divergence of that axial vector is related to the pion mass squared. Now, if the pion is almost massless, then something special happens. Essentially, the divergence of the axial vector is equal to zero. And when the divergence of a current is equal to zero, the current is conserved. 
And when the currents are conserved, there are low energy theorems, which tell you one of them, uh, for example, that when a photon, the electromagnetic current, when the photon scatters on an electron with infinite wavelength, uh, with infinite wavelength it measures the charge on the electron. So, you can then show that in a world in which m pi squared is equal to zero, that the divergence, and I realize I'm saying this very quickly, is equal to zero, it implies a low energy theorem. Now, long before W's were ever discovered, this low energy theorem was known, and Adler worked out the consequences of this. And he said, ah, in a world in which pions are massless, so now the Mandelstam variables, s, t, and u, add up to zero if the pions are massless. So this triangle becomes a point. What Adler showed that the amplitude we just wrote down, that if all of those were zero, the amplitude would have to be equal to zero. Now Adler was even cleverer. He said, ah, this doesn't just apply when all of the pions are useless. Let's consider the process pi pi goes to pi pi. Three of them have mass 140 MeV, and the other one is massless. Then it's still true that there is a low energy theorem, namely at the lowest energy you can have, which is when S equals T equals U equals M pi squared, the amplitude is zero. So for pi pi to pi pi, with only one massless. Pi on. F of S equals T equals U equals M pi squared is equal to zero. Now, of course, for physical mass pions, s plus t plus u is not equal to 3 m pi squared, it's equal to 4 m pi squared. But because the pion mass is very small on the scale of anything hadronic, the massless world is very close to the real world. So you would expect that even if the pions had masses, this would still be almost true. And in fact, it would tell you that there has to be a zero inside this Mandelstam triangle. If you remember a minute ago, we proved that the amplitude was positive. So something went wrong. But we'll see that it's okay. The fact that the pion mass is small is the basis of something called chiral perturbation theory, which says, though pi pions are strongly interacting, this low energy theorem tells you that in the neighborhood of the threshold, namely somewhere near here, the amplitude is zero. So though it's a strong interaction, it's zero at low energies. So that means you can make a Taylor series expansion in momentum round about that zero. So the basis of chiral perturbation theory is that you make a Taylor series about that momentum and that it should work. So chiral perturbation theory says scattering amplitude FTU can be made a Taylor series about 
about the low energy point or the low energy point. And so you have an expansion in terms which are the momentum squared over in Carroll perturbation theory. Instead of being the mass of the nucleon, it's 32 pi f pi squared, which is a number, again, of order 1 jeff squared. So this number is 1 jeff squared. So it says it makes sense to make a Taylor series because the terms are small. So Adler would have expected that the real world is not very different than the world in which one pion is massless and the amplitude has a zero somewhere inside the Mandelstam triangle. In fact, as we learned as I mentioned several times, the amplitudes are analytic functions, and so they can't just have a zero at one point, they have to have zeros on lines. So as soon as you say there is a zero somewhere in there, that zero is on a line. And in fact, it's on a line physically that looks like that. Zeros are connected to each other. They don't just happen at one point. What does this zero do? Well, if you remember two days ago, when this zero hits where the mass of the rho is, which is a spin one resonance, it becomes the Legendre zero of the rho and makes the rho a spin one object. And it's the same zero. It's Adler's zero. Now, what went wrong with our proof that the amplitude had to be positive inside the Mandelstam triangle when actually experiment tells us that there is a zero inside the Mandelstam triangle and in fact it's connected to the other zeros that you see in the scattering region. Now we made an assumption we made an assumption that the integral at infinity vanished. If it doesn't vanish, then you have to do what is called make a subtraction. And it tells you that not the amplitude, but the difference between the amplitude and the value along that line. And that has to be positive. I'll repeat that in a second, but let me stress, it's a rather amazing statement. Adler proved, only knowing about the low energy world, that there had to be a zero inside the Mandelstam triangle. That's infinitely far from high energies, yet it can only be consistent provided it tells you that the high energy amplitudes actually grow at high energies, and we know that that is true for these processes. They're dominated, for those who know what the words mean, and some people will know what the words mean, they're dominated by the Pomeron exchange or whatever. The total cross-sections uh, don't decrease at infinity. So there is a remarkable consistency, and analyticity does that. It connects one energy region to another energy region and says that con there are consequences of the amplitude having a zero here for what the high energy behavior is. So just to, to write a few words without doing the mathematics because we don't have time to do it. If I plot 
we started by doing this at a fixed value of t. So here is some line with a fixed value of t. And imagine you go one way or the other way. What you show, what we showed was the amplitude has to be positive and you can show that it has a minimum on this axis of symmetry. Because this channel and this channel are the same, if it increases going in this direction, it's got to increase in that direction as well. So if it's positive, it goes up in one direction and up in the other direction. If you make a subtraction, in other words, if the amplitude uh, doesn't decrease at infinity, then it is not the amplitude that you prove is positive, but the difference between the amplitude at this point and some other point is positive. And so now we have no problem about it being zero. The amplitude, so this is the zero line. This is f of s and t now. This is f of s and t plotted with t fixed. And if there's a subtraction, if there's no subtraction, then it's got to be positive. But if there is a subtraction, namely something that takes care of the high energy behavior, then all you can prove is that the amplitude at this point minus the amplitude at that point has to be positive, namely it has a shape like that, then we have no problem that the amplitude has a zero somewhere. And this is where we find the Adler zero. It's one on one side, one on the other. So this is, the top one is when f of s and t goes to zero when s goes to infinity and this is if f of s and t is less than s squared modulus of s squared as s goes to infinity. So Adler's low energy theorem is only consistent provided the amplitudes grow at infinity. Okay. So maybe I write one more sentence and then we can stop. Now, I'm sorry I had to do that rather fast, but it's remarkable that analyticity connects one energy region to another, which at first sight you would say don't know anything about each other, but just from the fact that total cross-sections are positive and they're analytic functions. So the Adler condition requires, even though Adler didn't realize it, that the high energy amplitude has got to be a, a physical process happens for other charges as well, etc. Grow as S goes to infinity. An experiment agrees with this. In fact, the amplitudes for S and T equals zero behave like s to the 1 and a very small number, something like s to the 1.02 or something. So one of the beautiful things is that analyticity connects different energy regions to each other. And so it says what happened in one region is connected to what happens in other regions. And chiral symmetry breaking is only consistent if amplitudes grow, and indeed they do. Not just for pi pi scattering, proton proton scattering, or whatever. The details don't matter. The crucial bit is to understand that energy regions are connected to each other. 
in the same way that the Adler zero, when Adler deduced that there was a zero somewhere inside the Mandelstam triangle, he didn't know that that same zero became the Legendre zero of the row, Legendre zero of the next resonance, and so on. But it does. Okay, we should stop.